I'm delighted to be here to just share a few thoughts about the discussions in this dialogue. They're important and they're timely. And we should widen the purpose for which we do these things. I've listened to, I think, Robert, Mr. Robert from the OHCHR, and I've also listened to the professor. It all comes down to one thing. What is the purpose of this glorified access to information? What is the main purpose? And my understanding is the overall purpose of this access is how does it transform the lives of the citizens in the country. Because we can end up being in boardroom discussion, elitist discussions about what we do, about access, Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth, without being context-specific about the various issues that emerge from where we come from. Where I come from, I don't want to throw figures and numbers and statistics, but the greater majority of people do not have, have access even to a telephone. And then here we are talking about Twitter, Facebook, and how Twitter and Facebook will give access to information to my rural mother, who does not have a phone, even if she did, she would not know how to use it, let alone smartphone. Are we being relevant to the bigger population? Are we? Or are we just flying above with the important things of the world, global issues, without dealing with the real transformation of things that hold our people back? That's a discussion I'm ready to have with you. I have listened to the speeches which were made and there's no mention of the ordinary person in the world. Well, I think that's the structure of the world, but being in my position and knowing how many people sent me here, it is my obligation to give a voice to those who don't have voices in these meetings. And I intend to do just that. As a responsibility to protect, protect what? individuals. Individuals' entitlement to what? Life, property, and information. State obligation to do that. A state that cannot protect private li life, private property, and information is not worth its name. Our country, Uganda, has already enacted the Access to Information Act. The history of that is that it was first sponsored by a private member, then government took it over. It became a government law. We processed it in two, it became law in 2005. The question is, since the enactment of that legislation over 2005, 2010, over this whole period, over 10 years, of what benefit has it been to the ordinary person since its enactment? So if we are to do a post-legislative scrutiny of this particular law, what would the ordinary person say about this law? Of what benefit has it been to the ordinary person, this law? Please do that research you people in the civil society organization, and tell me, because I want to know how this law has contributed to the ordinary growth of a citizen in this country. I would like to know. We have passed laws, 
lepas polisi who have created institutions of government who have given the mandate and even dis given discretionary powers to human beings to manage those things those things are in the place I've had the statement that information is a public good, and it is. But to who? To who? Is it just a high-sounding rhetoric? Or does it actually come in terms of action to help people who need this information to change their situation and status? And I insist we have to be give this thing some context specificity. And I, I cannot be in Uganda and talk about other places. Because I would not know what I'll be talking about. Two aspects of access. One is seeking out information from the government where every citizen has that right. Two, is the citizen having access to information in the already the public domain? If you're talking about COVID, it wasn't because of the presidential address where you have groups of 10, 20 people sitting on a small radio transmitter to listen to what the president was saying. If you are to rely on Twitter, Facebook, you will not have access to them. And yet they have a right of access to information in the public domain. What can we do differently so that we move away these discussions from boardrooms and conference centers to engagement in the rural dust and muddy places? Because if we can't change their lives, then we have no purpose saying the things we say so eloquently in big meetings like this, wired through what are these things called, the one I was watching. Let's start thinking. Section 3 of our law says promotion of effective and efficient government. Forget about the rest because they don't make sense to me. Effective and efficient. For what purpose? Effective and efficient in terms of public service delivered to the people. That's my understanding from the background I come from. Is it achieving that? Is it achieving that? Is this act in Uganda part of what the country thought it needed most at that time or is it part of the international drive? UN and all the big people to try and talk things which they understand but which the greater population of this world don't understand. I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Let's start thinking. And have this access to information in a way that supports transformational programs in communities that are so way below in terms of progress and development. I used to draft laws as a vocation. That's how I used to earn my money. Legislative drafting. One of the assessment criteria we use, apart from the instructions that come to a drafter from the government, we want this done, they give you drafting instructions, you start breaking it down into legislative language. Of course, there have been many changes. But the final assessment, when the law is passed, some aspect of post-legislative scrutiny is what in drafting we call Professor Zentaki from the uh, University of London called it the pyramid of virtues. The pyramid of virtues. At the bottom, the wider bottom of the pyramid are processes of drafting, consultations, and so on and so forth. 
then it moves up to issues of passing in parliament. But then when it's finally passed, it is the upper cup. And at the tip of it is what we call the efficacy of the legislation. Is it fit for purpose? Is it fit for purpose? If it is not, just shelve it. If you can't shelve it, bring it back and remove it. Because it's useless for purposes that help people sustain life. I've seen a numerous list of purpose under Section 3 of the Act, where they outline what purpose this law must serve. 2005, as the law met the standard of efficacy, was it met as it served its purpose? Or is it something that the Minister of State for Information, it, this is information, can come and say, we also have an act, by the way, when the UN comes and all the big people come, no, 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 we also have an act. We passed it all the way in 2005. Question is, what has it done since you passed it? That's a discussion we should have. My background is rural, and I speak rural. I don't speak the sophisticated ideas of big people and so on and so forth. And promoting access to information improves transparency.